All right. So if you don't mind, um, join me in welcoming Team Filter and Dave Gibbons to the stage. Thank you. Quite an introduction. Thank you. <laughs> um, so I thought what we do is have a, a sort of a bit of an, an informal chat, just a, a little bit about the book. Has anyone read the book or seen the book yet? Oh, that, oh, oh, oh okay. The rest of you later. Sorry. <laughs> well, it's good to know that some of you know kind of what we're, we're talking about and things like this. So um, I think really I, the thing that came out from doing this this book was. I've always been interested in the process of comics and, and how they're done. Um, but I was very aware that uh, everyone does comics in a very different way. But I never realised sort of how meticulous you are in your planning when you're, when you're doing comics. And that was something that came out through our discussions in the, in the book. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, perhaps you could talk a little bit about sort of you know from that germination stage when you you're, you're sort of starting to plan uh, a comic mm -hmm. um you know what what is that that process for you well i suppose the thing about comics is that you it, it's it's a trick you know it's a particular little talent you do which is to tell a story in words and pictures but you have to do that week after week page after page page after page and so to me the thing is was always to find a way to do it consistently. Because, you know, we all have good days and bad days, and some days we feel like working, some days we feel inspired. When you're doing anything professionally, be it comics or writing in general or even sport, you've got to be able to do it time after time. So you have to have a, a, a kind of an approach which enables you to kind of um, average out the good and the bad days and always produce something that is at least printable and professional. Um, I mean, some people would say it's anally retentive, but I just think <laughs> it's, it's good planning, you know. So I find if I, if I have a system that in, it enables me to be creative, because it takes away the kind of worry of, is it going to be good enough? Because I know as long as I follow the steps, it's going to be good enough. If I'm having a really good day, it's going to be really good. If I'm going to have a bad day, it's not, not that bad. So I always tend to go through a series of stages and I always make myself as much as I can complete each stage before I move forward. So the first thing to, to, to know is that you're, you're telling a story, okay? And you're probably telling it in a chunk of pages. Typically for an American comic book, it'll be 20 or 22 pages. So I always like to start with an overview of the whole thing, how the 22 pages are gonna pan out. So I would read the script. You know, most comics uh, have a script that is a little bit like a screenplay or a stage play. You know, there's a description of what's happening in each panel. And then there's the words that are being said or, or in the caption. So what I would do is read the whole thing through. And then I would read it again. And then I would actually read it again. Because you'd be surprised how easy it is to miss something the first time around. Or to maybe not appreciate how many pages there are. It's, it's happened to a lot of comics people. You find you're a page short because the pages have been numbered wrong or something like that. So I always read it, number one, take notes, read it, read it very carefully, okay. And then what I'll do is try and capture the fleeting thoughts that occur to me as I'm reading it. Maybe on the script itself, just scribble something that's just an indication of, of an idea for a layout or, or one of the panels that really really uh, um, communicates very vividly to me. Um, and having done that, I would then move on to the thumbnail stage, which is literally drawing things almost the size of your thumbnail. And in a very small area, draw, compose what's happening on the page. Okay, I'll whiz back in a minute. Yeah, just Show them the thumbnail too. There's some thumbnails. There we go. Thumbnail. <laughs> very small, they hardly even count as drawing. They're really just mapping out areas. And they're very compositional rather than being um, illustrations. And I'll, I'll go through the whole book so that I'll end up with maybe just one sheet of paper that's got all 20 pages on it, that if I squinted it from a distance, looks like I've already drawn the whole book. In other words, all the major decisions have been made. And because they're only, only little pictures, you can draw them, redraw them. It doesn't take long to, to change the whole thing. If you get one of them wrong, you can stick another one on top. So having done that, I would then do 
um, layouts, either on the, the finished board or on a separate sheet of paper. And on those, I would sort out all the problems of uh, perspective, anatomy, proportion, and end up with, well, this actually is a printout of a perspective grid, but I would work out all the perspective. I'd work out all where every major thing is. So I, I then, at that point, feel quite confident because I know where everything's going to be. I know it's going to look good as a finished comic. And then all I really have to do is draw it. So by doing the preparation, it means that the drawing is just the enjoyment of actually drawing something, knowing that it's the right size, knowing that it's in the right place, knowing that it relates to everything else. So I draw the whole thing out in pencil, which again gives you another opportunity to correct it because you can pencil and you can write it out, you can draw it again. And then finally I would do the ink line and that would be the final thing that would appear in print. And hopefully if you've done that preparation, by the time you do the ink drawing at the end, it's really easy, you're not even gonna make a mistake because you planned everything. You know where all the major areas of, of solid black are gonna be where all the details going to be. And so you can really enjoy inking it. Yeah. So that's kind of my method, and that's why I do it. So that at each stage, you're building on solid foundations. And I found that if I ever have a problem with a page, it's because I've skimped on one of the earlier stages. The traditional thing that comic book artists say is, well, it's not that good a drawing, but I'll fix it in the inks. You will never <laughs> fix it in the inks. <laughs> fix it before you get to the inks, knowing that you, you probably aren't going to go wrong. Right. So, yeah, so just don't leave those nasty surprises for yourself. Yeah, you yeah, and, and be, be quite thorough. When spoken about in the way that I'm speaking about it, it sounds like you've got to do this and you've got to do that and you've got to do this. It's not quite as, as prescriptive as that, but there is room for a lucky accident, but hopefully there's not any room for unlucky accidents. Yeah. <laughs> Well, if we just kind of go through some of the, the, the pictures that are from the book uh, and some that aren't in the book. I mean, one of the things, you know, talking about your, the meticulous nature, I, I think is a, is a very interesting thing is in publishing, everyone does flat plans. So you, you, you need to know exactly what's on every page before you even start sort of, you know, drawing it out. So, I mean, this, this is kind of interesting that you, you use your flat plans as also as a checklist. Yes. So... Yeah, because, uh, I mean, that's your overview of the story. You've got the whole story on one, one little piece of paper. And I think what's written there is a description of more or less what happens on that page. It's like a, a scene description. And if you're going to do um, comic books, um, it's a good rule of thumb that all scenes occupy a set number of pages. I don't like to change scene in the middle of a page. So it'll be this scene that takes place over two pages, three pages, whatever it's going to be. And if you've got it all written out like that, you can look at it and get a sense of the balance of it when things happen in relationship to one another. And it does also provide you with a handy sort of prison chart, you know, so that as you draw each page, you can just draw, draw a line through it. And that's actually quite encouraging, knowing that you're going to spend a month drawing something. It's quite nice to wake up in the morning and look at that and think, I'm about two thirds of the way through it now, <laughs> or, or I'm only a third of the way through it. So it does serve as a really good um, kind of uh, check sheet as well. I think I think it's what the other important bit is. It, it helps with your rhythm and your pacing, so you can see that if you're kind of halfway through the, the story and you, you're realising that it's not flowing quite as fast as perhaps it should, yeah. Or um, or reveals when you've got page turns. Sure. You know, you know that if you've got a big reveal, you've got to have it on the on the left hand side yes because that's when they turn over the page so yeah. you don't want to ruin it by putting it on the right hand side well that's true and I, I mean that's being aware of the restrictions of doing comics and that is one problem of doing it of doing stuff for comics that you use certain markers that you have to ad ad adhere to which is again where having a plan is is very useful because it is a kind of a modular business so to think in a modular kind of way is, is, is actually quite good. The thing that I would also say is a more general principle is I find when writing a story or when drawing a picture or drawing a comic, it's always good to work from the general to the particular. In other words, to always get the big shapes, the big areas, the big delineation of it down, and then work towards the detail. A mistake you see a lot of uh, kind of amateur artists 
make, which is exactly the kind of thing I do before I, I go into the business. You start on page one and you put a lot of detail into it and you never even thought about page two. So then you think, oh, actually, on page two, it would have been better if I'd saved all that detail for here because here it's going to be more important. So um, by having an overview of it, you, you, you always know um, the big picture rather than getting lost in the little byways. In fact, rather in the way that I'm getting lost in this little, little <laughs> byway of tonight's right. well, we'll, we'll move on. <laughs> so it's just a little bit about from the book there. It's a spread for writing for other artists, which is uh, yeah, an interesting section. And then I always thought this was, uh, I really like this. This was um, a little bit, for, for those of you who don't know, Dave started out as a building surveyor. So, um, has a very good knowledge of working on how architecture works. <laughs> uh, and this was a, a fax that was put together because you were trying to de describe to Steve Rude, the artist in World's Finest, yeah. what, what it was, but he couldn't quite get it. No. S Steve, Steve Rude, I, I don't know if you're familiar with his work, he's a fantastic artist, but there's, there's a thing that you find with certain um, people they have one area of their brain that's really well developed and the other areas of their brain not quite so much <laughs> so the problem Steve had was reading words and turning them into pictures when he got it he could draw the most fantastic pictures but I remember he phoned me up at some ungodly hour of the night because he hadn't quite got his head around the, the time difference between the, in the States. he, he yeah. was in the States and he said Dave I don't know what happens on page five or whatever it was I said Right, okay. He said, could you just read it out to me? So I just read out what I'd already read. He went, ah, <laughs> now I get it. But I, in trying to explain this scene to him on the transatlantic telephone, no matter how eloquently I talked, he still didn't quite get it. So I actually drew him a diagram because it's, it's this building that's shored up and the bad, and there's a protection racket going. It's like, if you don't pay the money, we knock the building down. And the guy goes around the back of the building and knocks out the wedge and the building collapses or it's about to collapse but Superman flies up and, and stops it. So I actually drew that for Steve. I just diagrammed out what was supposed to happen. I must say I felt like I'd failed because n normally as a point of honour if I write a script for another artist I like to do it in words. If I have to draw something I, 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 I never like it. I think it might be because I've occasionally had that done to me by writers. And once you've seen someone else's visual interpretation, it's hard to see it differently. So all you end up doing is actually repeating what they've drawn for you, which isn't always the best way to do it. But yeah, so yeah, by Dave Gibbons, associate member of the Royal Institution of Charter Surveyors. <laughs> <laughs> which meant I got more money for that page. <laughs> yeah. So, but, uh, I mean, that's an interesting thing you were talking about. Um, because a lot of writers do their own thumbnails for themselves, but yeah. don't ever actually show them to the, to the artist because they don't want to yeah. uh, influence them in that way. Um, I, I think uh, sort of Garth Ennis and Alan Moore has done yeah. it. Yeah, um, I, I know Alan drew, he draws out everything. I've never ever seen any of those. And I know that Neil Gaiman actually makes little comic books, he folds paper up so that he can get the impression of what it's like as a comic. Which again comes back to what I was saying. It's like, you've made this comic, there is a comic, it is going to work. Now all you've got to do is kind of bring it into focus rather than create it out, out of nothing. So for those of you who are interested in, in drawing comics, it's a really good stage to sort of get like a, a kind of a far off glimpse of what it's going to be like. Yeah, just, just for yourself, it's just to be able to see that it works and you don't have to show that you know you don't have to be an artist to be able to do that it could be just little stick figures so I mean, yeah i've yeah. seen neil's ones and they're, they're not great <laughs> no, it's not, no but, but it, it's enough to make you believe that it's all going to hang together exactly you, you can you can work your way having said that I'm, i mean i do want to be very clear and we stress this in the book and actually um, um tim stressed it in his introduction this is just my idea i wouldn't like to say there's a way you must do it maybe you could come up with a better way of doing it but the, the business of, almost, it's almost like an act of, I'm not trying to be Alan Moore now, but it's almost like an act of magic that if you can see it, it kind of already exists somewhere rather than it being an impossible thing to approach. Yeah. You've, you've got the map, you know there is a route, you know there is a way through it. 
Yeah, well, I think you know there is that 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 visualization, and yeah, as the, 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 always like in the martial arts thing, is like you've already done the act. Yes. So it's already been drawn in your head before you've actually put the pen to the paper. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. and then that's just the process of actually transferring that. Yes, and and actually with comics, I have to tell you, the the, the, the drawing in a way is the easy bit. That that's that never. I, I mean, sometimes the bit where you're trying to come up with the, the pictures with the page. That's the bit where you really feel you're bashing your head on the, on the drawing board and it just won't work, or you just can't get the look you want for it. The act of drawing is actually relatively simple, and that is just drawing. The art, the art of comics is translating the words into pictures. That's the absolute nub of it. And I think in this book, and quite largely due to, to, to Tim's supervision on this, this is what this book is re is really about. It is about that bit in the middle. It isn't about how to draw superheroes, how to do perspective. It's concentrating on how do you turn the words into pictures, and that is that is the essence of comics. See, because that's that's the, a nice bit that we've got here, which was a script from Walt Simonson that mm -hmm. uh, that you uh, adapted, but it was done in the Marvel style, which is that he basically just kind of roughly broke down what happened in the story it's almost like a prose story and then you had to break it down into what panels mm -hmm. up there and you sectioned off each area so what was going to be in each panel yeah and then you decided with your thumbnails then how that was done yeah um and then after you drawn it all then Walt did the dialogue afterwards yeah yeah i mean i've i've actually never been a huge fan of doing things in the marvel method i mean walter because he's an artist himself, he, he, he's, he, um, he um, has got a feel for how the page should look. So even his brief descriptions show a really good understanding of what, how much you can show, show on the page. And certainly when he came to add the word balloons, he knew just how much word is to put in there. But I think, you, I mean, this is a good illustration actually. That's the thumbnail, that's the finished page. The thumbnail's blown up, the full page is reduced down. And there's not a lot of difference between them in the balance of the black areas, in the in the density of it. So it's what I was saying. You've almost got the comic here. You know that that's that's the comic, and this is the comic just drawn a bit bigger with a, with a bit more detail, and in proportion. You know. Yeah. So it's it's just translating each stage. Yeah. The the problem with the Marvel method is that you get a description uh, of kind of what's going on. So you draw kind of what's going on and I hope you've left enough space for the balloons and then the writer gets it back and fills in what he thinks it needs to compensate for what you haven't shown in the pictures so it's always a little bit of a kind of a juggling act I, I prefer doing it full script both as a writer and, and an artist where the, the writer absolutely defines what's going on has got an overview of the whole thing has written the amount of words that he feels it needs and then as the artist, you execute those instructions. You obviously add to it. It's not just like you're drawing like a robot, you know, close up, long, long shot. But it's kind of focused. And just like I was saying about do the thumbnails, do the roughs, do the pencils, do, do, do the inks. It's OK, we've got the scenes, we've got the words, we've got the drawings. Now it works. Rather than going, well, I'll sort of fix this. If he doesn't get it, I'll fix it here and I'll fix it there. Yeah. It never seems to work quite as well. Certain kinds of stories you can do like that. And it's not for nothing that it's called the Marvel method. Because a lot of the original Marvel comics, you know, from the 60s or 70s, are very big on action. Not very much on character development, in my opinion. I've, I've had huge arguments with people about this, so I do say, in, my, in my opinion, I may be wrong, I'm not, but I may be wrong. Uh, um, um, if, it's, if it's an action thing, then it's a, it's a bit easier for the artist to busk his way through it. I remember getting a, um, a story outline from Paul Levitt, you know, who used to run DC Comics, but who was in love with the Legion of Superheroes. And I did a Legion of Superheroes annual, and his breakdown is, you know, page one, splash page of the, 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 the Legionnaires terraforming a planet, page two, and there was a little bit of description. And then I got to pages 34 to 38, they fight. <laughs> <laughs> so you had four pages so, of they fight. So you had complete carte blanche. Yeah, yeah, but in fact, if you think about it, even a fight, 
has opportunities for storytelling, character development. And I mean, I sort of did, I just took people fighting and tried to make sense of it and choreographed it. Um, so in those sort of circumstances, it can write, but it, it can work. But did, I, did you find, because you, you did do that uh, method with Stan Lee on the uh, imaginary Green Lantern story. Did, yeah. Did you find Stan had it a bit more refined than Paul, or, or was it? Oh, well. Was that a different, a different experience? Well, the, the thing I'd have to say about Stan Lee, and Stan Lee gets a bit of stick sometimes, I think because he is a great showman and he speaks very glibly. And some people don't like that. They feel that it's just showmanship. And also because Jack Kirby was treated actually very badly by Marvel, whereas Stan Lee was on the staff and got his name, name on, on everything. He's, he's been sort of tarnished because, well, you know, it should have been Jack Kirby's credit as well. I've actually found with Stan that he's a very fair-minded man. He's, he's a very decent person. And he also is a master of telling stories. I was going to do a Captain America story with him. And he said, great, David, it'd be brilliant to do a story with you. But here's the thing, you come up with the idea you plot it out, you draw it, and I'll just add the dialogue to it, okay? <laughs> and I said, yeah, great, so I'd, I'd do anything to, to work with Stan Lee. And he wasn't quite happy with the plot that I came up with. And I met him at the San Diego Comic Convention, and we actually went and sat out the back in a quiet bit, just on the floor, and he went through my plot and told me what was wrong with the story. And he was absolutely right. He just had like this innate, it was like the horse whisperer or something. It was just that <laughs> he knew what was wrong, and as he spoke, he, I could see him exactly what he meant, what was deficient in my story. Unfortunately, we never actually did that story together, but, but he would have had a huge contribution to it because he's just got this in, innate feel for, for, for story. Um, and that, I think he's realised that's the way he works best, that he can actually add the dialogue and humanise it and adjust the storytelling there and, and get a lot more stuff done. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I have to say, I've always been quite anti the Marvel way, but in recent years I can see mm. the benefits of it and I can see how it, it can work on both sides, provided yeah. you still have, I think that synergy has to be there between an artist and a writer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you have to kind of like get inside each other's heads quite a bit. I mean, that is because it is a very collaborative uh, yeah. medium. Yeah, and, and, and I, th I think also it's great if, you've all, if you're always working with the same creative partners because yeah. you know what they're going to do. You, you know how they're going to tell a story. You know you can trust them. But I mean, I found it even working with a different inker because I normally pencil and ink all my own stuff. But even to work with another inker, you find yourself drawing kind of defensively so that they can't mess it up <laughs> and, and, and I think that's the problem if you're just doing it as a writer a plot you want to know the guy isn't going to mess it up and that really only comes with trust that you build up over time and I mean it, 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 it even happened with something like Watchmen where Alan is famous for his very long and detailed descriptions the more we went on the shorter his descriptions got because the more we talked about it, the more we had the feel of it, the, the less he knew that he had to write. But that, there was that trust thing, because he knew where, where you were going with it, so yeah. he could just pull back a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you, yeah it, it's just like anybody you know very well. You don't have to have the full conversation, you know, a few signposts to let you know exactly what's going on. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I think I remember um, Garth Ennis and, and Steve Dillon, he would literally Sort of Garth would put like three lines in on the panel description mm -hmm. because he knew exactly that Steve was inside his head and would just get it completely. Yeah, yeah, and, and I mean, you know, um, d different writers have different approaches. I mean, I perhaps tend to write longer descriptions than some writers, and Alan, as I say, was famous for writing long descriptions. But the reason I write a long description, this might, and I think this was true of Alan as well, is you don't want to miss anything out that might be of use to the artist. So you want to say everything. And then as, as Alan would famously say, but if you can think of a, of a better solution, go for it, you know. Whereas there are writers like John Wagner, who's, who's written a lot of dredge, dredge, judge dread things. Um, he's famous for his terse and laconic picture descriptions. I thought you were going to say personality. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it'll just say close dread. 
Yeah, or say, <laughs> dread speaks into Mike, you know, or dread on bike. And, and, that's, and that's quite good. It does give a certain amount of freedom. And again, it depends on the density of what you're writing. Sometimes if it's just got to be dread on a bike, well, let the artist just do a really nice picture of dread on a bike. If it's important that there's something going on in the background and it's a certain time of day, then you, you have to say that. So in a way, that, that just as I'm saying there are rules for doing it, there are no rules for doing it. It depends on what your vision of it is. Yeah. I think that's an interesting thing to actually kind of bring up to the point on, on writing, is that I think, you know, you do have to think it all through when you're doing the scripting. Because mm -hmm. there's never that point where, you know, there's no point halfway through the story, so they go, oh yeah, and his jacket's purple. You know, oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. like, yeah. you know or, 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 you know, you've, you've missed out something you, that you should have at the, right at the beginning as those kind of cues for the... Yeah, well, I mean, what, that's why one thing that I would do with, with um, Alan's scripts is I'd read them through with a highlighter, and they were all great stuff. I mean, you know... The guy is a genius, but I'd actually think oh, I'll highlight what I really need to know. Basically, it's a close-up, or basically it's a long shot, and we when we, we have to see this. And Carlos Escaro, um, who's the, the the kind of artistic creator of, of Dread, he would actually get the editorial people to go through scripts with a big black sharpie marker and just excise everything that wasn't necessary. <laughs> yeah, it's just I can't we can't read it. If it's a close-up of dread, that's all I, all I want to know. You know, yeah. I don't need to know that the autumn leaves are fl fluttering down through the slanting sunlight. You know, <laughs> forget it. I'm not drawing it. You know, no, so it's all just Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's quite funny. So we have a um, flick through. I, I put that in there just because of today's news that uh, Tom Baker. But you you drew Tom Baker for quite a long time in Doctor Who magazines. I, I did th those are my audition pieces to prove to Des Skinner who was the editor that I could get a, a kind of a likeness of Tom Baker. Not a difficult character to get a likeness of actually, because big nose, toothy grin, curly hair, you know. Um, so I I quite enjoyed drawing him. Years later, I met him, and I said, Oh hi, I'm I'm Dave Gibbons. I drew you for years in Doctor Who magazine. Oh, did you old boy? Oh, jolly good. He, he hadn't seen it, he didn't, didn't care at all. Oh, really? some, some actors are really protective of how they look, and if you do likeness work, they, they, they want to check it over. I almost got chucked off the comic when they turned over to, when they moved over to Peter Davison, who, unlike Tom Baker, was very hard to get a likeness of, because basically, a nice guy, a great actor, but basically, the visual appeal of a blancmange, you know, that he, was, <laughs> he, he, was, he was kind of averagely good looking, Pale skin, no eyebrows, pale hair, you know, what, 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 what could you do? And I remember the first episode I drew of him, all I had was a copy of the Daily Mail that had two murky black and white pictures of him playing cricket. And I had to draw a whole eight page episode based on those two references. And they, were, they, were, they said, you can't do this, you're making our client look ugly. And um, so I said, well, I haven't got any references. So we then went along the very next week to the BBC studios where they were filming Doctor Who and he was a really nice guy, um, Peter Davidson. He let us take all the reference photos we needed. We got shots from all angles, looking up, looking down, <laughs> smiling, laughing, terrified. And after that, I was able to get really good likenesses of him. But um, yeah, um, bring, bring back Tom Baker, basically. <laughs> but I mean, that's, it's one of those things that I mean, I, I wanted to kind of get across. It's something that you, you always talk about, is, is getting that consistency in your drawing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, doing those, the, this prep work and doing the sketches and all the stuff before you actually even get to drawing the comics mm -hmm. is, you know, I, I, lo I always loved this, which was the, you know, the life of Martha Washington. Mm -hmm. you know, you've got to plan it up from birth. Up to fifteen years, and the, the height scales, and yeah. her into you know the sort of relevance to the size of the other characters. Yeah, well, I mean, I suppose in a way this comes back to what you were saying that if the character's wearing a purple jacket, the artist needs to know that on on page one. And with stories that go backwards and forwards through time, like famously Watchmen did as well, you know, you, you have to have in your head what somebody looked like at a particular time. And in Martha Washington, we see her growing up, so I wanted to know what she looked like, how tall she was. So when you originally saw her with this character when she was nine, you, you know, you wanted to see how she measured up when she was 13. And it's that kind of stuff that 
almost this subliminal. The reader, in a way, might not even notice, but it's a way of making the whole thing real. The comics I loved when I was growing up were things like Dan Dare, where they'd, they'd pose models, they'd build models of spaceships and, and locations, so they were always consistent. So that consistency has always been really important to me. And there's another aspect of doing something like this as well, which is using it as what they call um, a model sheet. And in animation, they use model sheets a lot. In other words, to have a definitive drawing of a character that every time you draw them, you refer back to. Because if you're drawing a character and you, you've drawn them in picture six, then you move on to picture seven and you look back at picture six to see what they look like. And then when you're drawing picture eight, you look back at, on picture seven. It becomes like that old game of Chinese whispers, that things, is that a politically correct thing to say nowadays? I think you can say and that. Like Chinese whispers, <laughs> where, where, you know, each time the message gets repeated, it strays just a little bit further and further away. Whereas what I always do is to draw a model sheet, a definitive sheet showing the proportions of the faces and the, and the bodies. And each time I draw them, I'll refer back to that model sheet. And then they stay on model, as, as we say in the trade. <laughs> and, and also the key that I've found to getting a good likeness or a good character design is to actually have a character design that you've done as a separate piece of design, not you've just drawn the character as they turn up in the story. But with something, again, that I had to come back to watch when If you look, forget the details of those characters, their body shapes are all different. You know, you've got Nightel who's a bit overweight, you've got Rorschach who's short, you've got the comedian who's a big blocky square guy. And if you establish those abstract qualities, it really helps you when you come to draw them late, later on. And if you want to draw a facial likeness of somebody, whether it's Peter Davison, Tom Baker, a creative character, what you have to figure out are the, the big proportions of the face. In other words, where the eyes are on the height of the face, how long the nose is in comparison to that. And that is where the likeness lies. It isn't in the details of eyelashes or nostril shapes. That's kind of secondary. So again, it's what I was saying, moving from the general to the particular. If you sort that stuff out, and admittedly, if you've drawn the same character a dozen times, you'll have those proportions set in your head. But if you can establish the overall design of a character and the overall proportions, it makes it much easier to draw them in continuity and remain consistent. Yeah. Well, that's just some sketches, uh, character sketches from Star Wars, which was a, a Vader's quest, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So, and then some. That actually. Is that, that from Doctor Who? Isn't no, it? you know that's actually a really obscure thing. I um, myself and Kevin O'Neill and an artist called Martin Asbury were summoned to the offices of, oh, of Ridley nice. Scott, who at that point had the rights and was trying to get the rights to Dune. You know, the science fiction novel by Frank Herbert. And he wanted us to do storyboards and designs for a sequence. And then he was going to choose which one he liked the best. You know? Right. And he wanted us to do it for nothing, for free. So you did do something? Yeah, so there's like these big yeah, factory yeah, yeah, yeah. walker things that they have. And there's this ornithopter, if, if you're familiar with the book, you know. It's like an ornithopter. It's like a cross between a helicopter and a plane. And anyway... Kevin O'Neill and I walked out and thought, thought, that's quite good. And then a bit later we thought, well, he's expecting us to do this for free. We shouldn't work for free. This is a big Hollywood director. So we made our excuses. But Martin Asbury, who at that time was drawing Garth in the Daily Mirror, um, he, did, he did do them on spec. And although the, the Dune movie was never made, he got a few contacts in the world of movie storyboarding. And he spent the next 30 years doing movie storyboards, and he's worked on nearly everything. Batman, Superman, James Bond. He's done storyboards for everything and got paid a lot of money for doing it and had some real adventures and, and high jigs because he was prepared to do it for free, whereas me and Kev said, no, we're not <laughs> doing it for free. So sometimes uh, it is good to be benevolent. Well, we, we could witter on for a bit, but if, if anyone's got any kind of questions... Um, Feel free to stick your hand up, and we're, we're happy to answer. Otherwise, we'll we'll just carry on waffling. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, you said earlier on that uh, when you're doing the, the, the final artwork, that you reduce it. Um, do you work on bigger sheets of paper and then smaller? 
Oh, oh, I see, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, when you're doing your thumbnails, you want to do them quite small. They want to be yeah. big enough you can see what's going on. But I mean, typically I'd get, what, maybe 12 pages on a sheet of A4, so they're, they're, they're quite small. Then when you actually come to draw the artwork, yeah. you would draw it much bigger, typically half as big again, or twice as big right. as the printed page. Because that then gives you the chance to actually draw it rather than do like micro surgery, yeah. and also it means when the artwork is reduced down in size, everything tightens up, everything becomes sharper, it looks more detailed. Yeah. Um, I mean, when I was a kid, I had no idea that comics were drawn bigger. So all the comics I drew up until probably the age of twenty were all print size, mm. and then when I started to do lettering on other people, I realised oh, you draw it much bigger. And when you draw it bigger, you can be much looser and much freer about it. You can enjoy the drawing um, a lot more. So um, I've always liked to draw kind of twice up. You can actually see there's a fracture line in American comics when I forget the exact month and year, but there was a month and year that the American comic book companies decided to stop having twice up artwork because it was too difficult to photo stat and scan and, and everything and have it done much smaller, have it done half up and you can actually see the month that that, that happened, everybody's artwork gets cruder and rougher, if, eventually they compensate but it was done as a money, a, a money saving thing but it actually meant to my eye that the standard of artwork went down. Was that during the paper shortages during the war? Or? Uh, I don't know whether it was anything to do with that. It was just that it became a question of it was easy to do the production work on smaller pages. Yeah. It meant that the quality suffered, but you know, never mind the quality, feel the width. Of, <laughs> was, was, was of course, now a lot of artwork is done digitally. It really doesn't matter yeah. because you can blow it up on the screen to any size you like. But even now, I'll tend to blow it up to twice the size. I won't go any closer than that. And then you can draw digitally with the same feeling you can get if you're drawing twice up on real paper. So you're drawing digitally mostly now, are you? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, what it's, it's, it, um, that's what I found works better now. Or at least if I don't do the whole thing digitally, I'll do the thumbnails digitally, I'll do the pencils digitally. And sometimes I'll print them out and actually ink in, in, in the real world. But it, it's, I'm so used to doing it on the computer now that that actually you know, feels the automatic thing to do. Um, what I say is because I, I draw on a, and any of you who, who work on a computer to do artwork, we know that you can get these graphics tablets um, made by a company called Wacom, but there are cheaper ones available, but Wacom are really high quality. And they do a thing called the Cintiq, which is like a computer monitor that you can draw on. Yeah. It's got a pressure sensitive pen. And um, I'd had one of those for a bit and I'd messed about doing finished artwork on it. But I decided that I was going to do all my finished artwork on it. And I remember inking in this picture and then filling in a big area of black with the paint brush, of course, not having to scrub it in with black. But I clicked on it and then I went to draw something in the top corner. And I went, oh, shit! Because I thought I'd drag my arm through the way. <laughs> and I realised at that point that I now believed it, you know? Um, so, yeah, I mean, you don't have to draw things digitally. I think the, the optimum way to work, it's great for doing layouts on, because you can resize things and, things and move stuff about. What you do after that, you can do any way you like. But I find, and I think most artists have found, that in that, the basic stages, the freedom that it gives you to change things is just brilliant. And of course, once you've got a thumbnail you like, rather than blowing it up by eye, you know, you can literally blow it up on the screen and then use it as a basis to do the, the layout. And as you said, you, you don't want to go too big, otherwise you're, you're doing every little pixel oh, and yeah. you just go down that rabbit hole. Oh yeah, you, and you find yourself doing a highlight in the iris of an eye and you know, that actually the finished page is going to be three pixels high and you can't even see the eye, let alone the highlight on the iris of the eye. So you, you, it's easy to get seduced by the computer and it's easy to let the computer run you. But what I've got it down to now is I never go beyond the blow up size that I would on artwork, and the tools that I use are the digital equivalents of um, a layout pencil, a finished pencil, a pen, and a brush. That's that's all. You know, I, I don't. 
you can infinitely change the brushes and what they do. But I've got it down to just a handful of things. So then I don't spend time thinking about, do I want the, the rough pen or do I want the rougher pen or do I want the not quite so rough pen? You know, you, you saddle yourself with a set of tools and that's what you stick to. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, so at the thumbnail, I think, obviously you get close-up, soft shots, etc. But how do you decide the size of the actual selection of the stuff like on, the, on the page? Oh, you mean how do you divide the page up? Yeah, just like, <coughs> this would be half, half a page. Something in the page, page layout. Yeah, well yeah. that... That is, like I was saying earlier, that's where the nub of it is. You know, you've got this page area. How do you subdivide that page area? And that really is crucial. I mean, doing something like Watchmen, where it was, I established it was going to be a nine-panel grid, tremendously simplified that. But, um, yeah, that, that is the bit that is experience and feel and, I was going to say, Talent, vision, maybe, might be better. I mean, what I would tend to do is figure out what's the, what is this page about? What is this page about? And which image on this page actually captures... This is a good example ...what here. it's about. So you've got that thumbnail of a uh, Hulk. Yeah. And you've gone for the big action thing. Yeah. And so the, the, the key thing that's going to draw people in is the Hulk being electrocuted. Yeah, and, and I mean, that's a particular way of doing it. It's the way we used to do it on 2018. There was, an, there was a rule, and actually not an unwritten rule, a written down rule, one big picture on every page. And um, you, can, you, can get, you can go in the wrong direction. Like you can end up doing the sort of artwork you used to get in image comics. And there were some good image comics done, but those guys, quite a lot of the time, are thinking about, I want to resell, the, I want to sell this artwork. So we've got to have a money shot. In other words, make the biggest picture on the page, the superhero in full costume, and then all the meat and potatoes thing around the corner. Which incidentally is why I sold all the Watchmen artwork for not very much money, because I figured people who buy original artwork, they want the money shots, and there are very few money shots in Watchmen. It's all pictures of people standing around in kitchens having angst. <laughs> so I'm not going to be able to sell many of these. I'm going to sell the few pictures where they're in costume and I'm going to get stuck with a load of pages that nobody's interested in. <laughs> Shows you how much I know. Um, but but um, So it doesn't have to be the action shot. It doesn't have to be the big shot. But this, It might be a close-up. It might be a, the emotion of a character is, is the most important thing. But again, if you're doing it on thumbnails, you can have several goes at it and see what actually looks the best to you. Sometimes you also have to accept that you're not going to get the optimal solution, that actually the puzzle you're trying to solve hasn't got a perfect solution, it's got a good enough solution to it. But again, if you work all those problems out at that small size, you're not wasting your time drawing you know, detailed pictures that you're going to have to erase and, and draw differently. So that's really where you have to trust your judgment and, and your vision. and. Um, where you as the artist really take charge of it. And that is an important thing, no, no matter who you're working with as a writer. When you come to draw it, you have to feel like you're in charge. You have to feel, you know, okay, I've got the information I need, now it's my, my decision. And if it doesn't turn out right or you can't solve it, well then there'll be another time when you probably can solve it. But the, the other thing is, again, if you're drawing comics on a regular basis, which you probably are going to be doing comics, You've got to move ahead. There comes a point where this is as good as it's going to get. Move, move on. So that's the point of doing thumbnails. You give yourself the chance to generate the maximum number of options in the minimum amount of time. Yeah. 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 Just when you did the watching, did you do the whole one in thumbnails first? I did a whole issue in, in thumbnails first. Yeah. If I had the script for that, for the whole issue. Okay, so, yeah, yeah. yeah, and and then, as I say, it's a weird feeling, but that almost is like you've done the work. You've you've done the sorting. You've done the the sizing. You've got the, you've got you know everything's there. It all relates to the other pictures. It it the pages re, re, relate to each each other. You, you know, there's that thing that I've said before that you if you just do it page by page. You know, in, on page three, there's some guy screaming, you don't understand. Yeah, big close-up, make a huge close-up. And then you get to page, page 17, and he's about to shoot himself, going, you don't understand. 
That's the big close-up. But you've already, well, it's an unfortunate analogy, you've already f fired the gun. <laughs> so you, you, if you've got the whole issue in your sights, this is great, I'm off, off on a whole gun analogy, <laughs> which is brilliant. You know, you, 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 you're not falling into a trap. You know, you're, you're not, shit, I've, I've already used that one up. So yeah, I would always do the whole issue. Uh, and if I, I mean, fortunately working with someone like Alan, if I didn't have it in my head, he had it in his head. So um, I kind of know what was coming, even if I hadn't actually done it. It's a bit. So he gave you the story, and you, how how free were you to work with him? You were working with Alan mm. because it's his story. Yeah. And your uh, interpretation. Of it. Um, well, I mean, I I had to tell the story that he written, but that would be a story that we'd already talked about. You know, it wouldn't just be, oh, what's, what's this, what happens now? It, I, I'd, know, I'd know what was coming, I'd have had my input into it. And then I had a very carefully worked out script to draw from, where he would give me a number of options, often, that I would choose between. But generally speaking, he'd be pretty much on it, you know. And also, because he would visualise the whole thing in a systematic way, it's a bit like the can of beans in the supermarket, you know. You don't want to take a, cut a can out because the whole thing's going to going to going to fall down. But I actually like that. And as I say, I've worked on Marvel style from very loose, low, uh, very loose outline and very tight things. And they're both challenges, you know. But the thing to do as an artist is you have to take charge and you have to make it your work. What's really interesting when I've seen some of Alan's scripts drawn by other artists. They'll draw everything he's asked for, and it just you know it, it's just in, impossible to do. So um, I never felt inhibited by having something thought out quite carefully beforehand. The worst thing is where the writer hasn't thought it out, and you're now going to have to spend a month drawing what they've written in an afternoon. You know that's the worst the worst scenario. But it's probably one of the interesting things I think is that often. I think people think that the the writer dictates how the layouts are done, and that's not always necessarily the case. I mean, they'll say there's you know 12 panels on a page or whatever, but a, a good writer will allow the artist to explore one of the most important panels and which yeah. ones to do on that rather than dictating. And yeah. you actually came up with the nine panel grid for Watchmen. Yeah, you? because I figured that was the best way to do it. It was obviously a very complicated story, and the the presentation of it had to be relatively, uh, not simple, but relatively clean. You know, if you if you change the size of the panels, it would have got very, very messy. I mean, it also gave Alan a lot of control because he could predict where everything on the page was going to fall. So it gave him an unusual amount of, of control. But that was for the good, good of the story, you know, really. That's, that's the other thing that I would have to say about collaboration. What you both have to have in mind is that in any collaboration is the good of the story. You do what's best for the story. You don't do what's just you want to do. Um, and it was a thing actually, actually that I became aware of only after I started to do a lot of writing for other people. Sometimes I'd be working with a writer and I'd, I'd make a suggestion and he'd go, yeah, it's a nice idea, but no. Nah. You think, you <laughs> it's a really good idea. But when you're a writer, you realise, yeah, the world's full of good ideas. It's great ideas. You could do anything. But it's got to fit the story. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to compromise your, your own desires for the good of the collaboration. You know, like check your ego in at the door. Yeah. That's how the good collaborations work. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Yeah, we're back. Yeah, I do. I mean, I mean the, 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 on, on, a, on a comic book page or in, or in any image, your eyes always drawn to the darkest darks and the lightest lights, the areas of contrast. Um, and so um, that governs so much of the impact of the page that it's something you really need to work out earlier on. Um, I mean, this I've only kind of scribbled the dark areas in. This is Darth Vader, so he's, you know, you know he's a big dark shape. Um, but yeah, on the particularly stuff that is ultimately going to be seen in black and white, it's crucial. With colour, it's a little bit more forgiving because there's what the colourist is going to do and there's that whole area of mid-tones. 
But on a black and white thing, that, that, that would be one of the things that I would work out in the thumbnails, you know, just exactly where the areas of solid black would go. And it adds, it helps the balance of, of, of the page and um, it focuses the eye. You can put the eye where you want it to be. So it, particularly if you're working for black and white, I would suggest that you do put that in. On some thumbnails I've done, I've, I've actually used grey tones as, as well with the Martha Washington stuff. I had a couple of grey markers because I knew that was going to be in like fully painted colour. So I, I wanted to kind of dictate where those tones were going to be as well. But the more you work out in the thumbnails, the more problems you're solving for later on and the more assured you are and more relaxed you are about getting a good outcome. So, so you, once you've done your, your thumbnails and once you've gone into the detail and done the basic drawing, you said that you hand the work over to an ink. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean the, the way that comics are done it is, can be a little bit of a production line. I mean, it's no coincidence that the, the kind of comic book, as you know, it was born in New York, and it employed a lot of people who used to work in the garment industry, where you get somebody did the cutting, somebody stitched the jacket, somebody stitched the trousers, and two hours later, a fully finished three-piece suit would come, come out the other end. And that was the American comic book model of doing comics. You'd have a guy writing the script. You'd have a layout man who'd pass the artwork on to the guy who penciled the foreground figures only. And he penciled, because he was the best draftsman, he penciled the foreground figures. And then it would go to the background figure artist who would draw the background figures. Then it would go to the background artist who drew in the buildings. Then it would go to the foreground face inker who was the best ink draftsman who would draw all the main characters. And, and then, as I say, two hours later, a finished page would pop out. So American comics work very much like that. Mm -hmm. Not to quite that same degree of specialisation now, but you would have somebody who draws the whole thing out in pencil, then somebody who puts the lettering on it, then somebody who inks it, who goes over the pencil drawings and ink, not tracing them, but drawing on top of the pencil drawings. Then you'd have a colourist, and then the whole job would be done. In my career, I've mainly penciled and inked all my own stuff. I've often had a colourist to help me because that's quite time consuming. And it's a bit like telling a story three times, you know, by the time you've penciled it and you've inked it, yeah. to then go through it and colour it is a little bit, you feel like you've al al already done it. So most of the stuff I've done, I've done the whole of the line drawing on it, but then the colouring is quite often, although not always, done by somebody else. But and then does it go back to the writer to do all the wording, or do have, will you have decided with him what the whole speech bubbles and the wording is going to be? Yeah, if it was done full script, you would you'd get, you'd have the script, you'd then pencil it, it would then generally be lettered, and then you know the space the verbal is going to take up, then it would be drawn in, in ink. It works a bit differently with British comics, they would be done, the, the whole finished artwork would be done, and then the verbal is would be stuck on. But, but basically the ink would be given pages that where the drawings were penciled out and the balloons were all inked in. Yeah. He'd ink that in and then it would go to the colourist. So that's, that's a fairly standard way to work. Yeah. But you can actually, you see the further you get in the process the more difficult it becomes to modify. On a little thumbnail it's really easy to modify. Yeah. On a pencil drawing you can move, move things around. Yeah. When you get to the, I mean, um, I, I, I stopped doing work for advertising because those people could never make, make their mind up. I, I, I had to do a page of the Green Cross Code with a Green Cross Code man helping two children cross the road. And in the original sketch that I got from the advertising agency, in one of the pictures the children were holding hands as they crossed the road. In a couple of them they weren't holding hands. So I went, before I drew it I said, are these children holding hands or not? And they went, they're holding hands. So I penciled the whole thing out, the children were holding hands as they crossed the road. Inked it in, okay, they're holding hands, fine. Coloured the whole thing, beautiful finished coloured artwork. Oh, Dave, um, could you make it so they're not holding hands? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So at that point, you have to do the artwork again, basically, because yeah. you, you know, it's, like in real life, it's easy to stop holding somebody's hand. Yeah. But in a comic, you've got to draw. It's, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. just a nightmare. So the, that's why I'm saying solve the problems at the front. Yeah. Don't wait till you've got fully coloured artwork yeah. and then, then decide the guy's got. Three eyes. You know. <laughs> <laughs> that was just an example. Really. Yeah. Are there any particular character designs that were really difficult to get the hang of in terms of a few cracks that I'm thinking about in terms of the weird alien, you know, Green Lantern or the other 
And yeah, I mean, one really good case in point was uh, I did um, a Superman annual with, uh, with Alan Moore called For the Man Who Has Everything. Mm -hmm. And that featured the arch villain Mongol, who's like this kind of beast. I'm sure Tim will find yeah, you. There we go. That. You see, and he's like this big, loomy, unpleasant looking alien person. But he's got these big sort of shelves above his eyes. And sometimes comic art is cheap. Sometimes they don't do those model sheets. Sometimes they just draw a front view that looks really good and a side view that looks really good. But actually that side view doesn't really relate to that front view. They haven't thought of it as a three-dimensional form, which is the key to drawing, by the way. Think of things in three-dimensional forms, draw them in two dimensions. Um, that's your bit of Zen knowledge for, for, for the <laughs> So when I had to, I knew I was going to have to draw Mongol. I thought, what does this character actually look like? What is the three-dimensional form of his head? So I made a plasticine model of him, of, of just his head. And actually, I've been going through a lot of my sketches and archives and everything recently, and I've still got that plasticine head of him. But I don't know if I sent you a picture, picture of him. Yeah. It, 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 it exists. But the interesting thing about it is, by the time I made it in plasticine, I didn't need it. Because I now understood the three-dimensional form of his head. Because I'd figured it out, I'd, I'd inhabited it, and, and, and I'd drawn it. So that's the worst problem that I've ever had. There are certain characters who are nightmares to draw. If you imagine, I've never really drawn any Judge Dredd. But Judge Dredd, it's, my God, it's an eagle, and it's an eagle and a shoulder pad, a, a, a zip and a chain, and a pouches and belts and it's just a nightmare. I mean it looks really cool when you've drawn it but to have to draw that every time. Whereas the really good character designs, and I mean a lot of American superheroes are basically um, a, a, a nude figure cleaned up and just with lines drawn, drawn that sort of stuff's really easy to draw. But there is a happy medium. So when I came to design the characters for Watchmen, I gave myself designs, I came up with designs that were interesting enough to draw and keep my interest, but weren't tedious, you know? So that's the thing to aim for, a good design that, that is, doesn't just rely on, on lots of detail. <laughs> or as we say in the business, you know, you haven't been able to order them with art. You can't order them with art, so now you've got to baffle them with bullshit, you know? <laughs> <laughs> See at the back there, right at the back. How did you end up lettering your own artwork? Because it's quite unusual for artists. Well, the, the better way to put it would be, how did I come to do the drawings, drawings <laughs> rather than just the lettering? Because, um, now my dad was a very honourable man. But my dad was, he used to work in town planning. And he was the guy who, if you wanted to build an extension to your house, or you wanted to build a house in a field, you would go along and see it. I don't know if you ever had to go to the council. And he'd come out to the desk and you go, I want to build this building. And he'd go, well, what you, if you want the council to approve it, you've got to change this, and that this, and they'll never pass this, so I suggest you do that. And he'd try and help these people, and then the, they'd come back with their revised plans, and it would go to the council, and the council would either approve or deny it. And if they followed my dad's experience and advice, it would probably pass. So he used to deal with the same builders all the time. <coughs> One of these builders said to my dad, you know Chester? I thought that was my dad's name. And I'm going to have to change my internet password now. <laughs> um, it, 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 it'd be much easier if you just drew the plan. And he thought, well, it probably would be. So being a young man with a family and a son with a taste for comics, you know, he had to make as much money as he could. <laughs> so he would draw these plans. And they would then submit them to the council. Now, there was nothing underhand about this. He couldn't help them get things approved that wouldn't otherwise have been approved. But he obviously, when I was, it must have been about 12, he obviously got a little bit paranoid about it. And he thought, well, the only thing that would connect this to me is the lettering on it. So um, <laughs> maybe young David, who likes to draw, maybe he could do the lettering. So I used to do the lettering on my dad's plans. He'd pencil it all out and I'd do the lettering. So I would know how to do neat lettering with an ink pen from about that age. And when I came to try and break into comics, the only thing about my work that was remotely professional was the lettering. <laughs> so um, I used to hang around up at Fleetway Comics, looking over people's shoulder and learning how to do comic book lettering. And one day it was, oh, we need this page lettered really quickly. Do you want to have a go at doing it? So I did. And I just about did something that was acceptable enough to be printed. 
but I, I got to be known as somebody who was quite reliable for doing overnight lettering. I also worked for Marvel UK, anglicising the lettering in that. You know, where the word colour in the States hasn't got a U in it, or through hasn't got the, you know, O-U-G-H on, 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 on the end. So I got known as a letterer, but the, the, the benefit of being a letterer to the aspiring artist is, as I think I mentioned earlier, you would get original artwork, professional artwork, to study. So it was almost like a correspondence course in looking closely at artwork and figuring out how it was done. So that was how I actually ended up doing the illustrations, because in the first case, I could letter. Not that I drew and then I thought, oh, I'll make a bit of extra money by lettering. But because lettering is such a crucial part of the whole composition, wherever possible, I would do my own lettering. Because basically, it didn't take me any longer to draw a balloon and letter it than it would have done to draw it and ink it and then have somebody else to stick a balloon on top of it. And in the case of Watchmen, if somebody else had been lettering it, it would not have been possible. It was only because I could arrange the lettering to exactly fit what I wanted to a very fine tolerance that it was even, even possible because letterers try and put the balloons in the right place, but if it doesn't fit, they've got no compunction about drawing it into another panel or moving things down, you know. So, um, it, you know, my, my dad's um, moonlight money making <laughs> actually paid off in the end for me. And he, and he never got caught. And he was, you know, I'm, I want to make this clear. It sounds like I'm bad mouthing my, my dad's criminal past. He wasn't, he wasn't doing anything illegal or corrupt anyway. It was just that it was a little, he might have put him in a slightly awkward position to explain. <laughs> so we've, we've got time for just maybe two more questions. One more, one more question. So just, just a bit. Mm. I, I've done every variation of that. I've done get the thumbnail, put it in a projector, blow it up to page size. I've done eyeball it. But the thing that I would say is that, again, if you've got the overview of the whole thing, the way I would tend to pencil is try and never get bogged down. Some pictures are really difficult to draw. Some pictures you've got to get really like cross with and say, look, you know, I'm not going to be able to draw you properly, but I'm going to draw you. And at four o'clock, I'm moving on to the next picture. You know, you, you've got to take charge of it. So wh what I found is if you've done the thumbnails for the whole thing, you could then go through the whole job and just do the layouts. In other words, draw where the big shapes go, make sure everything works at that big size. And then you could go back over it in another pass and do the finished pencil. And then what I would do if I got bogged down on the detail pencil would be to move to another picture where it was a lot easier to draw. Some pictures are quite easy to draw. If it's just a close-up or it's a silhouette or sort of something, you know, they're, they're relatively easy to do. So I would always be working over the whole thing, never completely finishing one bit, but always being able to move on. And then m magically, if, you've, if you had a page where you just couldn't draw the first picture, you just went on and drew the next picture, by the time you'd done that, the picture you couldn't draw was no longer very, very important anyway, because it wasn't the only thing on the page. I, uh, am I being clear? Yeah, clear, you, you, clear it's almost like you're warming yeah, up. On yeah, the it's, it's basically don't get caught up on anything. And if you do it with keep the, the method I'm saying, keep the focus. So thumbnails, you know what the finished thing's going to look like. You're now focusing on, we do rough focus. Yeah, we can see the big shapes. Now we're on the big focus now. This is a bit indistinct, but we move on to one that's a bit more distinct. And you almost fill it in. It's almost that sense of filling it in, not that horrible thing of a blank sheet of paper. Oh my God, what do I do? If you, if you follow the Gibbons method, you <laughs> never really you never really have a blank sheet of paper. You've always got something where a start has been made. You know, in, um, in writing, they call it the shitty first draft. Get it down, doesn't matter what it looks like. You've now got something you can work with. So um, yeah, I, I, would, I would keep everything. Um, I'm not saying this is so in my case, but if you look at the work of, of good draftsmen, some, part of their, some parts of their work aren't quite finished, but they're always good drawings. If you look at the sketches of the real masters, they haven't finished it, but what they have drawn is correct. So even if it's just a very loose outline, as long as that's correct, it's still a good drawing. And quite often you find with comics, because of time pressures, you've essentially got to abandon it. 
But if you, if you do the things in the right order, even a picture without a lot of detail is still going to be a good picture or an attractive picture. So that's kind of, I think that might be an answer to that. I'm, I'm really heartened, actually. So many of you are interested in what, to me, is this really critical stage of it, like the Big Bang moment, which is the thumbnails, not hooked on the finishes. So uh, I applaud your taste and get to see it. <laughs> I think we're going to have to wrap it up there for time, unfortunately. Um, they have got copies of the book in the shop. If, if you want to buy them, we're happy to sign them. Yeah. Uh, and if they've got time, you can pop upstairs, uh, and there's a whole load of Dave's original artwork and uh, sketches and stuff that appeared in the book and some stuff that didn't, so some Watchmen character designs and things. So if you want to have a look at those as well. And uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.